A reading from the book of Acts, the second chapter, verses 1 through 21. Listen for God's word. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea, And all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The history of humankind is in many ways a history of our search for new forms of energy, new forms of of power. And that history is actually pretty interesting. For example, 200 years before the birth of Christ, coal mining started in China. Then, 
about 800 years after that, the first windmill was constructed in Iran. Human beings have always needed power, and for centuries they have pulled it both from the ground and the air. Around the year 1700, the Maori people began to use geothermal power for cooking and heating. In 1839, the first solar power cell was invented. Now, we think of geothermal and solar as being new technologies, but actually they're not. In 1859, the first oil well in the United States was drilled in Pennsylvania. And this fueled the gas-powered automobile developed by Carl Benz in 1885. Oil and gas are at the heart of the internal combustion engines that have propelled cars and trucks ever since. And then, in 1908, the Black Hawk Generating Station was constructed in southern Wisconsin which, at the time, was really nothing very remarkable. Those type of facilities were being built all across the country. It started out as a coal-fired power plant and then was renovated over and over in at least seven stages into the 20th century. Eventually, it generated electricity with power supplied by natural gas. And then, in 2010, the plant was decommissioned as a power generating station. But you know what? It was still a powerhouse. It was just generating power of a different kind. Let me tell you what I mean. You see, Beloit College has taken over this Riverside power plant and turned it into a student union building focused on recreation and wellness. The college retained the architectural features and industrial equipment from the original Black Hawk generating station, but now the building generates physical fitness, personal connections, and healthy living. For example, a suspended three-lane running track runs through every single section of the building. The structure houses a fitness center and a recreational gym. There is an eight-lane competitive swimming pool and an indoor turf field house. On top of this, the student union includes a coffee shop, student lounges, club rooms, conference center, and auditorium, plus numerous spaces for conversation, or collaboration, or study. But the new facility is designed not only to benefit the students, faculty, and staff. The college also wanted to use the building to reach and connect with the community. So a new pedestrian bridge and publicly accessible elevator link the student union to a number, number of local pathways, walking paths, and parks. These new ties between the college and the town and the river are generating a more vibrant set of community connections. And you know what the facility is called? It's called the powerhouse. A former power plant is now creating a whole new kind of energy for Beloit College and the community around it. Our text today is about another new kind of power, another new form of power that was discovered there on Pentecost. The followers of Jesus had gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate a Jewish holiday, a Jewish holiday called Pentecost, or the Festival of Weeks. It was sort of a combination of several things. On the one hand, it was a, a harvest festival. It celebrated the spring harvest. But it was also a time to give thanks for the gift of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. The people of God were thankful for this law, which gave them the, the inspiration and the structure for their lives. The law was, in many ways, the power plant operating within them. But then, when the Holy Spirit entered a house full of Jesus followers, 
He created a whole new kind of powerhouse. It filled the apostles with, with new life, enabling them to communicate with a diverse group of people, speak boldly to a large crowd, and fulfill the prophecy of Joel. The Spirit generated a more energetic and vibrant community of faith, which was connected in new ways with the surrounding community. The apostles needed power. And they got it, though in a most unexpected kind of way. The book of Acts tells us that when the day of Pentecost had come, the followers of Jesus were all there together in one place. That's all there were. Every single follower of Jesus could fit in that one room. That's how few. But as they sat there, suddenly, from heaven, there there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. I love the part about the Holy Spirit coming as with a sound like a violent wind. It reminds me of other places in Scripture. Like, like the wind from God that swept over the face of the waters on the first day of creation. Like the breath that Jesus breathed on the disciples when he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Wind. Breath. Spirit. It's interesting that in the Hebrew and Greek, these are the same words for all three ideas. They are all the same creative and life-giving gift from God. Presbyterian author and pastor Fred Beekner says that spirit is the power of life that is in you. When your spirit is unusually strong, the life in you unusually alive, Beekner says, you can breathe it into other lives. You can become literally inspiring. And that's exactly what God did on Pentecost. God breathed and continued to breathe into creation. God's breath filled the apostles and inspired them, giving them the ability to go out and speak about God's deeds of power to the Jews from every nation who were there visiting in Jerusalem. The apostles were suddenly able to speak in a variety of languages, and the people were amazed and perplexed, saying to each other, what does this mean? While others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. Yes, when the Holy Spirit filled the apostles with new energy, new power, new life, and new ways of communicating, people around them simply assumed they were drunk. And in a sense, they were. They were drunk on God's wind, God's breath, God's spirit. God created a powerhouse on Pentecost, which gave the apostles a clean and sustainable source of energy. Unlike coal or oil or natural gas, the spirit does not contribute to climate change. Unlike the wind of the air, it is always blowing. Unlike geothermal, it does not require drilling. Unlike solar, it is available even on cloudy days. All we have to do is look for it and receive it. A great example of the Spirit's power is found in the speech of Peter here. Remember, this is the same Peter who, just a little over a month earlier, had denied Jesus three times. I don't know him. Never heard of him. (laughs) I'm not a follower of Jesus. You've got the wrong guy. But once the Spirit came to him, notice what happened to him. 
He was renewed. He was filled with a, with a new energy and new life and new courage and was able to step out there and make that speech. Acts tells us that Peter raised his voice and addressed the crowd, saying, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. These are not drunk, as you suppose. The Holy Spirit gave Peter courage. The courage he needed to stand up to the skeptical crowd and speak boldly about what God was doing in the world. The prophet Joel had said that God would pour out the Spirit on all people and that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's what Peter taught that day. Peter and the apostles were energized not by electricity generated by coal-fired power plants or wind farms. No, their energy came from a new kind of powerhouse, in which the Holy Spirit enabled them to speak in new languages, diverse languages, and offer a word of gospel hope. Like that powerhouse at Beloy College, this new life was not dependent on technology. Instead, it was generated by personal connections with God and neighbors. And it was spread through conversation and collaboration. Friends, this kind of power is needed today. This kind of spiritual power is needed today. If we are going to be a part of a church that brings life and joy and hope to the world, then we need this power. Peter told the crowd that God's spirit was going to change their lives for the better. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. One of my favorite Christian authors is a guy named Shane Claiborne. Claiborne is someone who saw a new vision for what the church could be and what the church could do a number of years ago. And he writes in his book, The Irresistible Revolution, that the early church was known as the way. Did you know that? Before the church was ever called the church, it was called the way. You see, it was a way of life that stood in glaring contrast to the world around it. Of course, everyone was forewarned that in this kingdom, everything is backward and upside down from the way the world thinks. Here, the last are first, and the first are last. Here, the poor are blessed, and the mighty are cast down from their thrones. Convinced that this way, this way of living, this Christian way, is a life-giving way, Shane Claiborne and a group of friends moved to a small row house in a very poor section of Philadelphia in 1997. Since then, they have shared food with people who need it and run a community store out of their house. They have reclaimed abandoned lots and planted gardens in the concrete jungle. They have rehabbed abandoned houses and made friends with people in prison and on death row. Shane and his friends have seen a vision of another way to live, the Christian way. And this vision is inspired by the Holy Spirit and directed toward changing the world for the better. People have been drawn to this way since the very beginning of the church. They have tapped into a new source of power that comes from somewhere beyond themselves. A power that is not found primarily in programs or policies or institutions, but rather in the Holy Spirit of God. This Pentecost power is an energy source that can keep people burning with love for God and for the people around them while radiating warmth and light to a cold and dark world. 
we can be a part of this Christian way. We can be a part of the Christian way by turning our church into a powerhouse. And when we do this, we open ourselves to the Holy Spirit, an energy source that gives us both the courage and the ability to connect with people around us in life-giving ways. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.